The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. If you want to be part of the program, you certainly can do that by sending us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Or if you'd like to call us on the Proclamation Hotline brought to you by Proclamation Goods, you can do that as well by dialing 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-7469. Proclamation Goods creates cookware for the eco-conscious home chef. Their pans are non-toxic, have a lifetime warranty, and are made in Wisconsin. Their award-winning stainless steel Proclamation Duo cookware set is a 12-inch skillet that doubles in a stock pot that doubles as a wok. Best of all, the skillet and stock pot hinge together to form a Dutch oven. It's two pans with the versatility of 10, empowering you to cook more with less. If you care about your health and strive for a more sustainable lifestyle, visit proclamationgoods.com. The supply is limited, so order yours now at proclamationgoods.com. All right. There is a number of things in which we do every year in the garden that um, make sense to us and what we have been taught to do for years. Um, but there's some science that we're going to go over that may or that that may or may may or may not prove what you've been doing is adequate. Right. So the first one is um, companion planting. And many people think that this is where you plant, um, I don't know, basil next to tomatoes because it makes the tomatoes sweeter or they're going to grow better or something like that. Um, another example that is seems very scientific based is a three sisters method. And it is a good method to use. However, there's this theory that the beans put nitrogen into the soil to help the corn. Which they kind of do, my, minutely amounts. Minutely amounts, but not the amount that you are are thinking that the beans are dumping into, the, or the, yeah, the right. beans are dumping the nitrogen into the soil. It's not, it's not like, it's a negligible amount. It's not some huge amount. Right. So you got the beans, you got the squash, you got the corn. They all grow together, but they are not doing what is a described in some platforms or some books. Um, they they can grow together very nicely, but it just doesn't do what you think it's doing. Absolutely, and that is what you want to keep in mind. Now there is something called intercropping. And intercropping is where you may grow lettuce or radishes, which are a cooler season, lower growing vegetable next to tomatoes. Or you would start with the lettuce and the radishes and then you plant your tomatoes. And then once the lettuce and radishes are done, your tomatoes are there. So there's that. But also you could do something like that with um, cabbage plants and spinach. There's a few different options. Okay, what are the options we've got there? What what can we do in regards to growing um, growing that? So you would just intercrop. So you think about growing smaller vegetables or, like or faster and with faster the slower. Growing, yeah, yeah, with the slower, and um, yeah. So that's basically it. You could also intercrop with squash and guide the squash outside of the bed and then put something in between the rows of squash. Yeah, uh, the squash, you want to be aware of one thing. Squash, it looks nice when you plant it in your little heel or your little area, but it can take up to 50 square feet in some instances, and even more if you're talking about the pumpkins. Uh, 50 square feet in many backyards, That is, and we're butternut, acorn, uh, uh, spaghetti, that consumes most of the real estate in many backyards, 50 square feet, to the point where you can't do anything else. And we're going to talk about growing squash, yeah. not to grow squash in the next next segment. next segment. Yeah. Yeah. But just keep that in mind that this companion planting, there's all these charts and a lot of these charts contradict each other. Your local university extension um, may not back this information up, but you might see Becky, the garden blogger, say that you should grow, not grow tomatoes next to basil. And then Bob, the, the uh, front yard gardener might say, yeah, you should grow basils next to tomatoes and it's just um, you got to make sure that there is some sort of scientific information. Now, there is something called trap plants. Yes. 
Um, and this is a, a companion planting concept um, where you basically have a plant that is going to allow for bugs or whatnot to eat it. Uh, yeah, you can sacrifice a plant essentially, allowing the plants or the, the well. We've we've done this with weeds too. Yeah, we've allowed weeds to grow in the garden and lamb's quarter, for example, and the aphids have attacked that and not bothered the other plants uh, nearby. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to leave some weeds in the garden. Obviously, if you leave too many, they will begin to uh, choke out what you are growing. Uh, another thing is... Trap plants are also known yes. as decoy plants. Decoy plants, okay. Yeah. We Whether you purposely plant them or they naturally come up as a volunteer or a weed, they can benefit you. Right. Now, this doesn't always work successfully if you try to, say, have a trap plant for something like a tom tomato hornworm. The tomato hornworm doesn't care. No. So it's it's kind of you kind of have to be smart about it and realistic. Planting flowers around your vegetables for pollination. Yeah, this is a good idea. Um, it does bring the bees in when the bees come into your garden. Maybe those some of those flowers are are taller, and the bees come to see them first, and then as as the you know the bees are there pollinating, then they might start pollin. They should. They will start pollinating your vegetables. Uh, can and and can we also make like uh, in addition to the pollinator or the, the the flowers? We can do other things to attract pollinators, and they're not just bees. They can be um, butterflies and moths and praying mantises and hum some, hummingbirds. Some beetles, yeah. Yeah. So if you are trying to attract the pollinators, definitely um, think about the flowers. And then if you are trying to attract things like hummingbirds they like the kind of, they call it like the trumpet flowers. right the deep the deep flowers the yeah. deep flowers yeah so that's their their thing you can also make a bee bath which what what is a bee bath it's where you take a shallow dish you could use like the bottom of a milk jug put some rocks and then put some water in it just so that the the rocks are slightly covered and then the bees will use it to drink Okay, and just water. We don't have to add anything like a like. For what I'm referring to is hummingbird feeders. You add a mixture of like sugar water to it, but no, just, the, water. just water for the the bees. Yeah, and you want those rocks so they can actually drink and then maneuver out yeah. of the the unit as well. They need a landing pad. A landing pad. Okay. Yeah. So, anything else we can uh, prove against marigolds? People say, well, and and we've heard this dozens of times. I'll, I'll plant marigolds around my garden, and that will prevent bunny rabbits from eating my vegetables. Right, and that's <laughs> um, I, maybe in a perfect world. I don't know what kind of well now friendly bunnies. You I have. and I heard this one time. I never did confirm this, so this is a perfect time to tell everybody what I don't really know. Um, my understanding is there are two different varieties of marigolds. There's a European variety and an American variety. And the European one will actually repel. The rabbit. So if you're listening over in the UK, send us an email, gardentalkradio at gmail.com. We know we have listeners over there. Is there viability to this particular claim? Well, the other thing is, is that if we don't have access to them in the States, it doesn't really matter. No, no, right. but it would just be nice to know that you you know they've got something that we don't in regards to that now uh, we'll, we'll get to the conclusion of the, the bunny rabbits here in a moment but also people will to keep deer out of their garden they will dangle soap or uh, aluminum plates or bowls to make noise and this this might work and has worked and continues to work for some people but when a wild animal is hungry enough especially say you live in a drought, you're having a drought time, or you live in a drought area, or just a high deer population, this might not work. So yes, this might work for some people if you have one deer that's easily spooked and. Is but they will get back. accustomed to that noise. Right, they could get accustomed, and so you got to keep in mind that there is, there's not like a scientific proof that, yeah, deers do startle and scare easy, but have you seen the ones in the city? Right, exactly. Uh, it, your best so, bet is just to get a, a bottle of deer defeat and use code radio to save 10% on your order. That will deter deer, rabbit, and groundhogs from your, uh, it'll keep them from eating your plants and vegetation. Like you said, Holly, it doesn't matter what you do outside of the deer defeat. 
um, soap or a metal pan or whatever, if an animal is hungry enough, they're going to eat whatever is available. Much like, and we've heard these stories in the camping world that, oh, we camp in bear country, but there's not really, if a bear is hungry enough or a fox or a wolf is hungry enough, they're going to come after whatever or you've a got. Or a raccoon. They're going to come after whatever you've got. It doesn't matter if there is a fence or if there's noise. If they're in a situation where I've got to eat or I'm not going to live, their instinct tells them to take the risk and get what they can in, to, in order to survive. Deer, rabbits, groundhogs, a little less um, uh, life-threatening, but it's the same concept that their instinct is survival and to whatever means it takes to survive and to protect the offspring. So... Um, that said, if you are a hunter or a fisherman, fisher person, um, and you have the availability and the area in which you can remove these animals and make your own sausage uh, or meat or jerky, Walton's has that all for you. If you're not one of those people and you need seasoning or tools for your kitchen or barbecue, they have that as well. Yeah, Walton's has everything that you need for canning or for processing doing anything but anything yeah doing anything but the meat um again they have the spices they have you know if you want to make some delicious snack sticks sausage jerky they have all that information there for you at meatjustics.com and then they also have all the supplies you need anything from meat grinders mixer sausage stuffers to help you go from animal to edible walton's is everything but the meat if you use grow use code grow 50 you can save 10 percent off of 50 dollars or more that's waltons inc.com or meatgistics.com. For more information, please visit the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com.